in this place, listening to everybody speak. I want to start with a very brief story of um, how I read a story, an article in, in at about 2006. That was like 10 years ago. I was at about 16 years then, and um, I read an article of some three kids in the United States who um, decided to be millionaires before the age of 16, that is. But I was 16 at that point. I wanted to be a millionaire at 18. So I gave myself a two-year gap to become a millionaire in Nigeria. You know, I, I, I started a company with um, 10 of my friends. You know, I was still in secondary school then, I think. You know, and the name of the company was Ambitious Men of Africa. Now, we really wanted to make money. You know, I really wanted to make money because I wanted to make a mark. I wanted to make a point for people to know that it's um, possible for a Nigerian to dream of becoming a millionaire and hit it in a record time of two years. You know, uh, the truth is, I'm not a millionaire now. You know, and it's over 10 years. <laughs> you know, but it's a reality. Now, now, this thought set me on the path, you know, and I mean, thank God I didn't become a millionaire then because I may have not had sense, you know, the kind of sense I, ha I have now. Because I just wanted to make money to live good and um, to be a big boy, really. You know, it comes with um, the making money thingy. Now, so I, 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 I decided to go on a journey into myself. Because I discovered that some were not really working for myself, but I had to create that path. So first thing I did was to begin to seek knowledge, seek, um, try to get a good education, went through my first degree, wasn't contented. I, I'm not a book freak, I don't like reading, I hate reading, you know, but I love knowledge, you know, so I had to read to gain knowledge. So I went into UI to study humanitarian and refugee studies. I was sitting in the class one day, and I was so interested in the whole refugee, internal displacement thingy, and a, a professor said to me, it's a female, Professor Bola Odegbe of, of UI, sociology department, she says, if you're so passionate about this thing, why don't you take out time and go into the Northeast? Now, I saw it as a challenge, you know, because at that time we had over 2.5 million displaced persons in Nigeria. Now, I mean, the concept of internal displacement was just hitting us for one of the first times. It wasn't really new, but it was the first time we had to have a niche as a national niche for internal displacement. So I decided to go into the Northeast immediately. I left um, the University of Ibadan. And the first place I went to was Adamawa State. See, I, 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 I just had, I just had a, a, an Excel sheet that had all the camps you know, in Adamawa State. I got that from a, an organization I was working for at the time. You know, and I went into Adama without an ID card. I went into Adama without, I just took my bags and I just decided to go. Now, it brings me to my first lesson. You know, my second lesson, my first lesson is get knowledge. My second lesson is be fearless. Now, I mean, it was still in the rave of the Boko Haram insurgencies, and I was determined to go around the IDP camps in Adamawa State with nothing, with no security presence whatsoever. I mean, everybody goes into the Northeast. You can go into the Northeast if you have a very solid security backup, but I was ready to. I made my trip from, from, from Abuja to Adamawa State. I spent 15 hours on the road, and I got to Adamawa around 11.30 p.m. I remember that night. I had to trek to where I was going to stay. Now, the reality was that I, I told myself, Busai, if you die on this trip, you die on the side of posterity. You know what I mean? The world would just realize that I mean, somebody lived, and I, I may not be so, much, so popular, you know, but I mean, I lived for something and I died for something. Now, so my, my incursions into the North has brought me close um, face to face with the realities of internal displacement. And I'll share a little with you guys. I discovered we had um, segregations on who was an IDP. Now, an IDP is nothing big. An IDP is just someone who has left his place of habitual residence because of a well-funded fear of him being killed or him being oppressed, you know, and all. The Boko Haram insurgencies and all. And people had to leave. Now, I got, I got into, the, the, into Adamawa to discover that we had what was called the formal camps and the informal camps. What are the formal camps? The formal camps are the camps where the government, you know, takes charge of everything. You know, the government takes charge of education. The government does stuff. Now, this is Malkohi camp. This is, they have, they have schools. The military board for education is there. They have health. You know, they have water. You know, they have um, hospitals where women could give birth. They have all these facilities. It looks beautiful. The military is there protecting those people 247, you know. But my reality struck me when I went to this camp. This camp is Markohi Settlement. It's in the Markohi um, Access. Now, this camp is 
less than five minutes walking distance from the formal camp. They call this an informal camp. Now look at the outlay of this camp. Very terrible. They live under trees, kind of, you know, dried grasses. They have tapolins. Some international organization gave them tapolins to live. Man, these guys are, are actually IDPs. Now my first question was, why do we, you know, define who an IDP is by the camp he is? Now a camp has protection of government, has food, they are fed, they are taken care of. But a camp that is just five minutes walking distance from that same camp does not have these facilities. Their children do not go to school. They live in very messy conditions. Their, their hygiene is not taught about. Now these guys, it's, it's quite unfortunate for these guys because a whole lot of them are actually oppressed again by Fulani headsmen. Now, I will explain what that means. Now, see these crops I have here. Now, these guys actually go into their farm to harvest their crops before it gets ripe. You know, because they, the Fulani Maurandas, you know, they come around and they destroy these crops. Now, we call it, in, in the academia, we call it secondary displacement. When someone is displaced the first time and displaced again. And nobody really cares. The government doesn't give them food. The government doesn't give them anything. They don't have anything to live by. Now, these guys are still IDPs in their country. They have not left their territorial integrity or the, the borders of, of their country to another country. And they are still oppressed in their country. Now, this is another um, formal camp. It's called the NYC camp. This camp is closed now because Adamawa State government decides to restart the NYC scheme there. Now, I mean, you can see for yourself food supplies you know, very consistent, you know, food supplies. Now, this is what struck me. I took this picture myself in the morning. This was at about 10 a.m. in the morning. Well-grown men sit down to play Ludo. If you really look at it, you see a Ludo in their midst. Now, these are men that have pride themselves in, in being able to take care of their families. These are men that pride themselves in a conservative northern society where a man is seen as the head of the house, but that, that identity has been taken away because of internal displacement for reasons that most of these people really do not know about. Now, so these men have subjected themselves to keep body and soul fit by playing ludos in the morning while the women go to you know, the formal centers where they can learn a skill. Now, there is a social disequilibrium here. Now, when these camps are closed, these men would have to take the back seat because the women will have to begin to transact business because they've learned a skill or two, and the men will become, may feel oppressed, and, you know, it's a whole messy situation. So the family structure is actually broken down, you know, by the eye situations we have. Now, they have a central cooking Everybody forms line to eat. Now, I took this picture of this guy. He was trying to study. That's a book in his hands. That's um, a pot, you know, behind him. This is a kitchen. He was trying to just read something. Now, the truth of the matter is, if Boko Haram, you know, was against, um, as they called it then, if they were against, truly against Western education. Now, let's, let's look at it as, as rational people. Do we say Boko Haram has succeeded in pushing these guys out, you know, because they actually push them out of schools also, and these guys cannot have access to the kind of education they need to have. Not forgetting the fact that in one of the formal camps I visited, I saw children that were attending schools for the first time in their lives. These were children from, I, do, I really don't have to call them children because they were most, most, mostly from 18 years and above. They had never attended schools before. It brings to thought what their various governments had been doing before the internal displacement issue we have. Now, these are thoughts I'll just open for us to, you know, just think about it as I, as I roll along. Now, this is an IDP settlement, Fufuri IDP settlement in Adamawa State. Now, this settlement contains over 3,000 children. None of them are attending schools. I mean, absolutely none of them are attending schools. No health care, no support from the government. They are left on their own. Now, the beautiful part of these things is the fact that it brings us close to face to face with a realization that, um, Maybe we are not taking our priorities right, or maybe we're not setting our priorities right, because a whole lot of these displacements come from, I'm careful to state this, but I mean, this is an open forum, and I, I think I can say what I have to say here. Now, I'm careful to state the fact that the cause of this displacement still resides in, in, in the space of, the, of governance. Now, I mean, the Boko Haram issues, you know, any issue that causes displacement, you know, it traced back to the failures of governance. Now, this trip was, was one of my last trips before I left Adama. The trip was very crazy. I woke up this morning and I didn't really want to go to this camp. Mubi, Mubi was occupied for over 40 days by um, Boko Haram. Boko Haram ran this, this community over. This community is like the Lagos 
in, in Adamawa State. Now, Boko Haram was in charge of, was in this community for over 40 days. You know, they, they actually hosted their flag in this community, Mubi community. Mubi shares boundaries with Sambisa. Now, so when I heard Sambisa, I, I was scared. I, I really didn't want to go, but I, I summoned courage. I mean, I was already at Adamawa, and I'd already made up my mind to die if, if necessary to just push this course. No, so I, I, I got into um, Mubi community, you know, as it were. Now, wh while I was going, I had this accident, you know, on, on, on the way. Now, this, 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 at this point, at this point, I sincerely wanted to turn back. I had traveled for two hours already. I sincerely wanted to turn back because I felt probably God was trying to say something to me. You know, son, don't go there. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. But I summoned the courage to go. Now, it brings us to the, back to the point of being fearless. Most times when we try to engage life, when we try to push things from our perspective, when we try to, you know, hit a target, you know, there are so much fears. There are, there, there, there's the fear of the unknown. There's the fear of what will happen to me if I um, go, if I do what I want to do. Am I not too young to do this? Would I have enough finances to do this, you know, and all? But I had to still move into this community because this community gave me a bedrock for Practically, what I started doing, IDP, in, um, IDP support group, the IDP support group I started as an advocacy drive towards um, pushing for the government's national policy on internal displacement. This camp is, is very, very, it's a beautiful camp. It's a transit camp. You know, when people are rescued from Sambisa Forest, they are brought to this camp. You know, they are debriefed and they are taken into the city to see the um, Boko Haram elements from um, the, the, the casual, normal citizens. Now, I mean, it's, it's a very beautiful place to go to. Now, my quick thoughts. I want to share my thoughts on the way forward. Now, I started up an IDP support advocacy group on, on Instagram, you know, when I published all these stories on internal displaced persons. And one of the few things I pushed for was durable solutions. Now, when there is an internal displacement issue in Nigeria, everybody goes into themselves and we begin to summon... Um, we begin to summon people to bring food stuff, bring um, mattresses, food and all. Now, those things are beautiful, but that is the lowest level of internal displacement. That's the lowest level to help the situation of internal displacement. And I'll tell you why. Now, because it's not sustainable. Give them food, they are going to eat the food. The food is going to be exhausted. Give them anything you give. It's going to be exhausted. There's what is called durable solutions. Um, reconstruction, rehabilitation, reintegration. A whole lot of these guys are going through post-traumatic disorders that you may not imagine. I met people that has, had lost their minds because probably they lost parents, they lost their businesses. I met a man who was a civil servant, but I mean, he, he lost all his certificates, he lost everything, and he can practically not do anything. So he's on the message of the government, feeding daily from the government. Now, durable solutions is what we should push for. I mean, if everybody in this hall, you know, makes a tweet today to push for durable solutions, it's going to go a long way. The government is going to listen. Now, we have a national policy document for internal displacement that is lying probably in the locker of somebody in Abuja as we speak now. Now, this document is going to help us have a niche or create rights for internal displaced persons. As it is now, you know, I, 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 I wish I, I, I showed us this letter. You know, a few weeks ago, I wrote a letter to the National Commission for, uh, no, National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, and it was an FOI letter, and I requested for NEMA's expenses from 2014 to 2017 on what they've spent on internal displaced persons because I received a, a, a very direct word from one of these IDP camps I visited, which was a formal camp, by the way, that they hadn't supplied food for them in three months. You know, imagine people that have been fed by the government from 2014 and in 2017 for three months they were not given food because these guys are really not allowed to work. They don't have that flexibility to leave those camps. You know, and I had to write that letter because NEMA claims it, you know, manages the, 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 the challenges of internal displaced persons. But we know that what they do is procurement. Now, I mean, I'm trying to say these things for us all in this room to understand that these things are real. And it can happen to anybody. Now, if we don't speak for those guys that are vulnerable now, the numbers are dropping. But I mean, the numbers are dropping into a state where we'll begin to find... When you think about the population of Zambia or, or, or Gambia, for example, and you compare it to the amount of people that are displaced in Nigeria, you know that a whole country was displaced in, this, in, in, in Nigeria alone. Now, so the national policy document is line follow in Abuja in somebody's desk. I mean, if we begin, if we do an advocacy on that to push it out and to, to get it passed, passed into law, it will go a, a, a very, very long way. Then I want to talk about, lastly, on transparency and accountability. I work for an organization called Code, Connected Development. What we do is we follow the money. 
Now, I mean, one of the reasons why I came to code in the first place was the fact that when I went to the field, I saw that humanitarian materials, relief materials were being diverted. So I was looking for an organization that would be able to place a check on government, they will be able to place a check on agencies of government, you know, to ensure that everything that comes into the Northeast, as it were, would be accounted for. We have not gotten to that level yet, but it's work in progress. Now, Follow the Money is, 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 is an initiative to track government expenditures, especially in education, um, health, and the environment. Now, the truth of the matter is, we have to become responsible citizens for durable solutions to take place. We have to become very responsible citizens, active citizens that must engage governance at all levels and ensure that every money budgeted for anything or pushed into anything must be used to, the, to its logical conclusion. Now, the, 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 what, what fascinates me about the code, the follow the money agenda is the fact that it's, it's, we have a platform where everybody, everybody seated in this room can come on. It's www.ifollowthemoney.org. It's a citizen platform where we conscientize citizens, where we conscientize people about their state's budget, what the government is supposed to do for you, your constituency, what is coming to your constituency, and ensure that these things are delivered through online and offline advocacies. Now, I want to finally close you know, with these thoughts. Now, people slept in their houses on a Saturday night in Benue State. I was actually in Benue State that night and they woke up on Sunday morning as internal displaced persons. Now, it is not only um, um, insurgencies that can generate IDPs. Any other thing can generate, development can generate IDPs. Flooding can generate IDPs. We had IDPs in Lagos. The only difference was that we had big boys who became IDPs in Lagos, so that they didn't call for support. But people slept in Benue State tonight, woke up Sunday morning, and they became IDPs. They became internally displaced. We had running into over 100,000 people. Now, this is a reality, people. This is a reality. We can never run from it. Nobody bargains to be an IDP. Nobody negotiates to be an IDP. When life happens, when natural disasters happen, when there is government failure, IDPs can be generated. And the truth of the matter is, any of us seated in this room could be an IDP, including myself. People call me IDP because I do a whole lot of work. And I, sincerely, I don't, I don't see it as an insult. Because the truth of the matter is, the difference between we that are sitting in this beautiful place um, this, this afternoon and the people in the Northeast or the people in Benue suffering from the flood is just time. And if we don't correct that abnormalities, if we don't correct that lackadaisical attitude of government, if we don't correct that, that system of government that wouldn't give um, uh, uh, the, 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 the rights of, of, of people that are displaced to them, when we find ourselves as displaced people, we may not be able to talk because we would be vulnerable. My name is Busayo Luadamilare Murakinyo. Thank you very much for listening.